and it, just to let them know that you're not sure mm -hmm. if they were up front as you mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I'm not sure about that. Just don't be afraid to talk to the teacher and say, I'm not sure yeah. what happened here. Uh, yeah. And they, I didn't start doing those things until I've been in the school for a while. And they, you feel more comfortable mm -hmm. and I'm sure I'll have to there, there's a lot to know down at Teens Premier. You will not know all of it. You will not know when the lessons are, how you just, there's too many different things going on at one time. But that's okay, you know, they'll, they'll fill you in, but it's just that part of being, you know, kind of open and aware in that same way. Um, so, Rick, I think you have a handout called Communication Hints. Yeah, let's do that one next. Let me take one from you. And there should be enough, I think, for everybody here. Um, so these are just some, some suggestions of how to talk. You know, often I say to, to families, it's always easier to go to the side of a child or teen and talk to them than it is to go face to face. Um, for sometimes a, a child or teen, that can be a really uncomfortable or antagonistic approach. And so can someone do some drama with me? we do some drama with me? So if I need to talk to her and I see her kind of, you know, dancing around, or no, I'm just kidding, you don't have to do the whole drama. Dancing. So I'll let you come up this way. And so if I need to talk to her, instead of like walking right at her, I might kind of come around and then I might, hey, just go check in with you. You can even talk this way. I can talk from behind, you know, and those are less ways to put her out. And sometimes it throws them off enough that it's not a big deal, you know, but coming up like this. And all of a sudden, shoulders go up. <laughs> I chose the right drama, didn't I? <laughs> but trying to find different ways, and especially a young child who's starting to get agitated or aggravated, um, I'm not going to make direct eye contact with them and walk towards them. I'm going to come this way. I might even ask a child to move away a little bit, you know, and um, you know, might just bend down beside them. You know, you seem really upset right now. I wonder if you wanted to talk about it. You know, if you know the child a lot, well, <laughs> did you, would, would it be okay if I gave you a hug? Would you like a hug? You know, so sometimes <laughs> <laughs> those kind of conversations are easier to have, and it doesn't make them feel like I don't like her, you know, and get that feeling if they feel that. Thank you. Appreciate it. You know? <laughs> so you've got the communication hits. You know, I put my paper down somewhere. Thank you. That's all. Sorry. Um, so what's one that speaks to somebody? Stop that. <laughs> yeah. Might have to highlight that one. What, what to say instead? No kidding. Great job. All of this is like my vocabulary <laughs> right here. <laughs> I have to put on a different hat when I come in. <laughs> so instead of saying stop that, you can say, um, it, it appears your pencil knocking on the table is upsetting Becca. She's asked you a couple times to stop. Are you here? You know, ask. We're also really careful about not asking questions we already know the answer to. <laughs> you know, if I already know the answer to that, I'm not going to ask that question. If I'm not sure, then I ask it genuinely. But I don't ask it with sarcasm or snarkiness. I just state what I see, you know. And if I think that me saying that to him, even quietly, <coughs> just individually to him at a table, uh -huh, then I might say, what, why, why? You know? Like, I just, I just want to share something with you privately. Would you mind walking to me? Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you walking. I, appreciate, I know that was hard. You're right in the middle of something. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but Beck has asked you a couple times about his pencil. You know? And so if we give them the why behind why we're talking to them, the chances are that they're going to change the behavior because of that reason instead of just because I'm telling them to. Increases, right? What else is speaking to anybody? Yeah? Don't pick up sticks. I have 20 pieces of mulch in my car. <laughs> 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 so have you found another phrase that works? Yes, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start using it. Yeah, what's it say? the mulch in the flavor. Oh, there you go. Let's keep yeah, it. No joke, I have like 20 pieces of mulch in my car. And so even, if, you know, a kiddo that you don't like, you know, did you know that they get mulch for the school playgrounds every summer? And people have to put it, to put it all out. I wonder if you'd like to put these in a bag and we could take them back into Glen who manages that. <laughs> <laughs> and see if you'd like to use it 
next summer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have something. Now you might get more just to give the glance. So you got to be careful with that. More mac and cheese in his office than anyone on the plane. <laughs> what else is speaking to you? Um, I have a question. Why the one like, for instance, what a beautiful draw going? Yeah. Why not? I mean. So does anyone else want to answer that one? You want me to run with it? Because, uh, I learned this last year, and it goes along with the great job thing. And I can, I have mistakenly done this, even just after school when I pick him up, and he's got his drawings, and his friend has his drawings. If I say to my own kid, just in front of his friends, "Hey, I really love that. That's beautiful. I, I love those, you know, that drawing," he will then. They, all of his surrounding friends will all go get their drawings and they all come at you with their drawings and everybody's drawing has to be beautiful and it, it creates like a, a lot of chaos where I learned last year to say like, oh, I really like how you use the color blue in that or um, something just to, to complement it but without giving it, you know, like a great job or a, it's, it's really great, they're really beautiful. So we don't want them to think it, that the value comes from us, right? Do you want to share something? I was just going to say Montessori's approach is always to try and encourage someone to do something because of an intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. And it, honestly, it doesn't really matter what I like. Mm -hmm. if, if they like it, then that's really what's important. Like you, I like to give compliments. And so this is a hard one for me. Mm -hmm. I like to say, oh, that is gorgeous. <laughs> you did a great job. Mm -hmm. But in the philosophy of Montessori, the idea is to help children grow with this desire to create something that they like. And so, although it's hard for us, because I was raised that way, my teacher said, oh, great job. You colored that flower yellow and green. Every flower after that was yellow and green. Yeah. <laughs> so it is hard for me. And so I, I really relate to that question. You're not the only one in this room, probably, that feels the same way. But the philosophy still is, when we slip up, that's OK, too. We all understand that. The idea being to encourage the child to want to do something because they liked it or because they want to do it. And that gives them the freedom and permission to experiment and do it differently next time. Yeah. And just to pull out my geek card, motivational research talks about how great job and that's beautiful actually don't motivate children in any significant way because it's not specific. What did I do that was great? What about it made it beautiful? So they don't know what to repeat, so it's not motivating. So you spent a lot of time on that drawing. Gives them a specific factor that they can turn into yeah. motivation. That's exactly where I'm going to go. I'm going to learn all that far in. She had an art class and struggled a lot with it, just really yeah. struggled. And then she took another one and it was like, I could tell that took a lot of time for you. Yeah. And it wasn't the best drawing, but I was, that took a lot of time. And then she appreciated that we saw how much time it took. Yeah. And sometimes just knowing that somebody appreciates that you yeah. try yeah. is all that matters. So in one example, you did use the word appreciate. I appreciate the whatever you did. Or when they do something, to thank them. So in my head, I try to figure yeah. out that fine line yeah, between good right. job and that's beautiful. That's to right. I appreciate or thank you. So yeah. is it just a fine line? It is a fine line. But I think one of the, one of the litmus mm -hmm. tests we use is uh, changing that child's behavior to need more from me. You know, like I could say like to a child, especially a child that's more like, Okay, so I'll use cat and dog in this example, right? So you've got the dog kind of personality that wants to please, right? And it's always there to please. You've got the cat-like personality that is like, don't get near me, <laughs> like I'm fine by myself. And so depending on what kind of very extreme stereotype personalities that I'm dealing with, I can say I appreciate that to the cat child very well, right? If I do that with a child that more wants to please me, it probably is going to change their behaviors towards me for a while. And so the litmus test is, how do they respond after that? You know, and then I know what I need to pull back. <laughs> you know, like sometimes I go too far. I get excited too. You know, like oh my gosh, you know, they're like oh, and she left it. You know, like oh no, I went too far. You know, and so it's like watching, and so it's that observation piece. We have sort of talks a lot about the observation piece is the most important role of a teacher is to watch what happens next or after or during. You know, and then to respond to that. So. You know, we try not to use things like, 
I appreciate how Susie's sitting. We don't do things like that, right? We're not going to catch a child being good because now again, children are going to do things because they want to be caught being good, not because they're doing it from within. So there most certainly is a very fine line there. But I think you're on the right track of trying to think about it as, you know, and then again, how what happens next or how they respond to that. Something that was helpful for me was something that I learned actually in my experience with the 0 3 program, um, sports casting. And in zero to three, you're just like a sportscaster, literally saying out, saying, saying out loud uh, <coughs> what you see. And I've reflected on that a lot and have been able to carry it over um, into my older children also. So if you want to say something or comment about something, you don't want to say good job because it makes it about you and your preferences. Um, but you can make an observation about what's in front of you, like the drawing class. Oh, this seems like, um, hey, this week you guys are working on sketching with a pen. And, and you could just stop there and see, it works with my teenager, who if I say, how was your day? Nothing, it's fine. No answer. But if I make a specific observation um, like that, and sort of, <laughs> right? then yeah. there are <laughs> many details that come out of his mouth yeah. following that conversation to fill in my gaps of understanding. Um, and I've left an open window to say, hey, I recognize what you did today. And it gives me the opportunity to fill in more information. And I found that that works with any age kid. Um, if you feel the need to respond, and it may feel a little wonky at first, but responding about something that you actually do see in front of you um, <coughs> in the same way that you would another adult. Like, oh, you did a drawing with a pen. Like, that must have been really intimidating. If I was to be you know, talking to my partner who showed me a sketch of something, I would make that kind of observation. Because wouldn't it be weird to come home to your spouse and be like, good job, you did that at work today. <laughs> 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 you know? We like, could all so you know, speak like that. It helps me to frame it like that. Like, oh, that does sound really weird if I did that to you. Um, so that's kind of my litmus test. Would I say it to him? No, okay, can't say it that way to my children. <laughs> Um, and if I feel like responding, responding about something about the, the situation that's in front of you that's an observable thing and not a judgment about liking or disliking you know, And so you, you fall short, you know, this child brings you up this, here, I, brought, I made this for you. And oftentimes it means they don't want to walk over to their cubby area and put it away. But anyway, you can take it as they wanted to give it just to you. Because sometimes that's the truth. As they say, here, I want to give this to you. And you're like, oh, what do I say? You know, and you go, good. And then you go, good golly, you spent time on that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like you can catch yourself, and you can also, you know, just say thank you. Like I think sometimes we go all into all this, and you just say thank you. You know, like that fits the, the toll for most of the situations. Um, we also don't do much correction. You know, and it really is dependent on the child and where they are in their development. A three to six year old that's writing with the Google alphabet and writes cat, C-A-D, I'm not doing a thing with that except observing and thinking about, hmm, do they not know the death sound? Or was there a multitude of other reasons that happened? So I'm making note of it, you know, and I might give them some other uh, materials and ask them to practice or other lessons to see what happens next to figure out, is that really a sound they don't know? But telling a child that writes, and, and first of all, three to mostly eight-year-olds at least, are only writing, they're not spelling. You know, they're not working on spelling books, they're just writing what they say out, what they hear. And so we allow them to write what they hear. We don't want to create children that write very safe sentences so they can spell them correctly. And so for some parents, that's that conscious emotional legacy for you. You're like, what? <laughs> you know, my child spells their own name wrong? Well, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't have the conversation at a different time. When you correct it in a moment, it's, the chances are they'll start, they'll start changing their behavior, and that's that observation piece again. Does spell this right, mommy? Does spell this right? You're like, oh my gosh, I went too far. <laughs> what did I do? You know, like, and then you have to catch yourself and regroup. And so instead of, you know, like, you were wondering about how to spell your name. I'm wondering if you'd like to just practice that at night. We could just work on parts of your name and what letters we use. And then they could practice it in isolation without them being wrong, right? So you're doing it together instead of going in afterwards when they're finished and telling them what it is. That's not what they're going to remember. You know, when that child gets seven, eight, depending, and they start writing the T-E all the time, I'm going to demystify that with them and talk about 
sight words or puzzle words, words that don't follow the phonetic language, and why we have to look at those differently. And would you like to know how to spell some of those words? Do we like to practice the way they're spelled because you can't really sound them out? And so we have that conversation, which leads to a key experience on sight words, puzzle words, that kind of thing, right? And so again, we isolate what the difficulty is, but we don't come in after the fact that we got that wrong, we got that wrong. Even up here in the teams program, we're very limited to how much we overload them with. We don't want them to write for us, we want them to write for them. And so if we don't give them all the things they needed to do to make me happy, <coughs> we talk about the things that they're working on. And so we work from that direction forward. And so we want them to write more, because when we read more and write more, we improve those language skills, and then we put those lessons in to help to tie all of it together. <coughs> Questions, thoughts about that? Yeah? A really good example about that. I have a little guy in turquoise, and he researched and did a huge project on brain tumors. And he researched, and he had all this, and he wrote the whole thing out. And he spelled brain as Brian every single time. <laughs> and his teacher says, this is his word. He took so long. And I didn't have the heart to say, you know, that's his Brian, because that would diminish all the work he'd done on that project. That's all I could see from that point forward, yeah, right? It's Brian, right? Yeah, all of the work that yeah. he put into Absolutely. it. So he has this huge paper, and we still have it on Brian. <laughs> <laughs> So it's a process, and so you know that's one of those things for the Montessori home piece. We encourage you to think through as well about the correcting piece of that. Um, you know, for some of us, that's the way we grew up. We're like, well, I turned out okay. Well, you know, right now you're in a Montessori school. <laughs> maybe you did, maybe you did. I don't know. <laughs> right now you decide to have your kid up here, and those are what the things we're doing here. And so it would make sense if those things were consistent at home. And so, you know, to talk about those, sometimes families get together and come up with a family plan. You know, the parents, partners come up with what is it that I want to improve on this year with our support of our child. So those might, that might be an area that you want to talk about with that. And um, if your child's always asking you if it's right, there's probably out of balance somewhere. You know, sometimes it's personality. But most of the time, it's something environmental that you probably need to reflect on. Maybe it's babysitter or grandparent. And so thinking how we can support them differently. Any other thoughts or comments about this? Is this helpful? Yes. yes. Yeah. Very helpful. So study it. There'll be quizzes next week. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then the going out trip orientation. Rick, I think that's our last um, <coughs> page there. And I'm just giving you this because um, a lot of families really want to go on going out trips. And they're going to go over this again with you before the going out trip, they meet with the parents. Um, but I think it's really important to, um, to kind of think about those things ahead of time. And some of it's really unique and different, you know. And you might be going because you want to have this experience with your child. And so one of the things on there is if you want to be with your child on the going out trip, you probably need to have a conversation with the teacher ahead of time. You know? And sometimes they might encourage you not to be with your child. And sometimes they might ask you not to go on the going out trip or that they're not taking any more parents from the camping trip. And so that's not because they don't think you're a wonderful person. I'm sure you are. But they want to help that child to gain some independence maybe or to you know, branch out from their comfort zone. And, um, and so you just might want to think or process that. But those are some of the orientation pieces that would go over before that. Yes. Say that again. For people, to, yes. Yeah. It's all the handouts and that piece of paper they fill out with questionnaire. Is that a question? So we've got some live on. we got this one. Sometimes it's big. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. So it may not have anything to do with it whatsoever. It's all about space. Yeah. Because that's the space. Yeah. Available space. For how much space? <laughs> Some kind of camping trips. Yeah. Okay. Just. Mm -hmm. Okay. Want to move this forward? With the spirit of sacrifice and enthusiasm, we must go and search like those who travel in foreign lands. This is what the adult must do who seeks the unknown factor that lies hidden in the depths of the child's soul. The adult must find within himself the still unknown air that prevents him from seeing the child as he is. And so, again, the, that's that spiritual preparation of the adult. The role of the adult's different at this school. Like, we've got to be in tune with ourselves in order to see that kiddo with fresh eyes. 
Um, sometimes, you know, when you might come in, you're like, oh my gosh, that child's such and such age and they're not doing this or that. And so we don't see a child as a deficit. We see a child as where their strengths and goal areas are and how we move them forward. And so you won't always know the background or where that child was six months ago or, you know, how amazing they are at building uh, pyramid structures. <laughs> and so we all have strengths and, and gifts with that. And so trying to see that child unfold themselves in a way that gives them, again, great dignity. So in preparation of the adult, you can see, like, this child giving this lesson and, and Child's Work Night's coming up, what, next month? Mm -hmm. And um, and it's it's so beautiful. I love to just go around and watch the parents. It's my favorite part of the night. I love to watch the children, but I love to watch the parents because sometimes they're just like, first of all, they're like, I have no idea what this child's doing. And sometimes the child's not even doing what the lesson is. It's hilarious. But um, and still, it's just this great discipline that the adults show in those in those uh, in that time period and letting that child lead them and not try to correct or ask them too many questions. And so we do the same thing as subs and volunteers. We try not to put kids on the spot. So Maria Montessori called it a three-period lesson. Does anyone have any knowledge of that? <laughs> you do, right? And so first period is when I just name what it is, right? So I name that these are um, the one bead or the 10 bar or the 100 squared, 1,000 cube. So I would just name that. That's the first presentation. And so I might say, do you want to hold the one bead? You know, do you want to hand the one bead to, to Bolivia? Do you want to do this and that? And so that's just the first period. The second period is practicing with it. And so we might um, point to it. But again, we're not correcting. So we might say, you know, uh, Becca, can you point to the 10 bar? And Becca might point to the 100 square. And I, and I say, thank you. <laughs> and I say, um, you know, um, can you name these again with me? We'll start with the one bead. And I'm trying to see, you know, but I'm not going to say to her, just like I'm not going to to um, point to um, um, Dixon and say, can you explain to us who Dewey was and how he gave um, us education and what his beliefs were? <laughs> so I wouldn't go to the third period and put someone in that spot, right? She's like, oh, give me five minutes. <laughs> we're education majors and we don't know that, right? I can kind of fudge my way through a little bit. But you know, like we did the same thing with children. We say, you know, what's this? You know, they're like, I don't know. <laughs> you know. Like you told me so many things there, I have no idea. And so we don't go to that third period, which is what is this? Or say, tell me what this is, unless we know that they're going to be successful with it. And I think as a culture, we do that so much with humans, with young humans specifically. We put them in situations and we go, who's that? And who's that? And what, what do they do? And what, you know, and they're like, <laughs> And sometimes they love to perform for us, but then again, the observation piece is, are they performing for us, you know? And so that we try to be really careful with that part of the process, is that we try to only have them give us what they're ready to give us, and we stick in that second period until we know that. Um, so here's some other um, key supports. Helping versus hindering. Is, is that possible? Can you help too much? Allison, what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden, they're bringing you their coat every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, young children are so much more capable than to give them credit for. Uh, yeah. 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 There's definitely such things that mean too much. Yeah. So we try to be really careful with that. It is okay. If a child puts their coat on backwards and upside down, and their their hood is back down here. It's okay. It'll be all right. And so they put it on themselves, and they're very proud of that, and we're okay with that. And so we try not to put them, you know, like if the next day, I might go over a little sooner and say, can I show you the magic trick that happened in a way, different way to put your foot on? Would you like me to show you that? Maybe you can show other children that too. Like, I might have that conversation, but I do it before they put their coat on. <laughs> I don't do it when they're, after they put their coat on, because now, more than likely, they're gonna bring me that coat every day, because now they know they didn't do it right and they don't want to try it again. So we really try to wait to see if they need our help. Um, they don't learn that process until they do it, you know? So we really, and sometimes we'll say, they've got trying to get this go-gurt open. Do you even break go anymore? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Gosh, yes. <laughs> yeah. 
Even though she they asked us not to. That's right. They, they can write notes on them now, I saw. <laughs> no tubed foods, I believe. Yeah. Not a lot no tubed foods. <laughs> they can do it but half of it gets on the floor right and so again it's that part of how do I give them a first period lesson before they attempt it you know how do I help them without hindering them and then they bring it to me every day so I love that observation piece. observing versus staring <laughs> can you imagine right <laughs> you know like <laughs> you know, <laughs> Well, sometimes I find myself, sometimes I'm trying to teach the lesson by looking at them. <laughs> like, <laughs> instead of just observing, watching them put it together entirely yeah. and correctly and hoping that they will learn about their own. Cool. Yeah, because that, the magic is in teaching in a way that allows children to discover their own learning. That's right. Yeah. And so sometimes helping to finish a project or helping to do something or, or staring at them to get their attention so that they can see that they're doing something wrong. They're looking at me, what have I done wrong? Yeah. You know, it's that it's a it's a big it's a big picture thing. That's really hard to get it all. So Yeah. Try a little and Ray Montessori said even a smile can break the concentration of child. You know? And so we try to work on what we call emotional equilibrium. You know, we try to ignore our thoughts, you know, and not that we don't share love and celebrations. But we also don't try to, you know, um, manipulate their feelings or their actions based on our looks, right? So we try to, you know, so if I really want to see this child, I might come to the back so they don't know that I'm looking, <laughs> you know, and I might really try to observe. And, and for some children, they might say something like, why are you here? Why are you looking at me, you know? You're like, oh, I'm sorry, was that making you uncomfortable, you know, or whatever? Um, but, you know, really trying to think about our, our ways of being. Well, I was just going to say, I, one of my earliest memories as a child, I mean, just super early, I, have, I, I just remember I was very shy, and I remember people would always smile at me, and it would scare me, and I remember why it scared me. I remember that. Well, um, it was because I didn't do anything, you know? Like, there's got to be something wrong. They're like showing all of their teeth and, and, <laughs> and, and I, I hadn't done anything. I was just standing there and it, I remember it, it scared me. It scared me that people would smile at me. So from yeah, even very early, <coughs> that's right. Yeah, I think it's important for us to recognize that, right? We don't know how a child, and so um, being really conscious of that. Um, talking versus nagging, you know, like, if, if, we, if we keep saying the same thing over and over again, are we going to expect a different outcome, right? You know, like, did you choose work? Did you choose work? Did you, did you choose work? You know, like, we try really hard to not be in that mode, to get them in a process where they're constantly, um, you know, you'll see them, they'll start doing this when they see you coming. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And so, um, instead, just try to connect with them. Hey, tell me about your weekend. You know, and they're like, oh, you're not going to ask me about work this time, <laughs> you know, or whatever, right? So, really trying to help them to recognize that you're interested in who they are, and you know, um, you wondered if maybe they could show you. You saw that they had this material out. You're not really sure about it. Would you? Would they mind showing it to you? You know, and that's really eye-opening. You know, and, and sometimes it, it changes their perspective when they get to give somebody else a lesson about something. Encouragement first praise, we kind of talked about this earlier, but you know, like when a child finishes the 100 board, lays out the tiles, 100 tiles, one of 100, it is <coughs> fascinating. The first time they do that, it is really hard, you know, to not be excited for them. But we try to mirror whatever they are doing. If they're like, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> and we're going, <gasps> you know, like, okay, I probably went over the balance with that, right? And so instead, you know, they're like, I did it. Like, oh my gosh, you know, like, what'd you think? You know, like, I put them all together. Did this take you all morning or was just the last hour? I think it was the last hour. Wow, all the numbers went in. Oh my goodness. You want to count them together? And when you ask that question, you have to be ready for the answer <laughs> because it takes a little while to count them from 1 to 100. And so I learned later on to say, you want to count by 10? Like, no, I want to count by 1. I'm like, okay, let's do it. You know? But what's amazing is, is when they do it, you do say two or three other children start coming over and they're counting and, you know, but it is, you know, that, that encouragement that's genuine, that's real, and I'm just mirroring that with them, and I'm celebrating with them, but I'm not making it my celebration, right? And that's the difference. 
when that starts to feel like they need me to get excited, then I've probably gone over the balance of it. Uh, listening versus being heard, you know, probably really important down here, <laughs> the teens program, um, but it's important all throughout the building. You know, it's like, you know, uh, in your mind, some of us are very efficient. And so when we're in the environment or we're, we're volunteering, we have a, we know what will make this work quickly. <laughs> and we've already got the idea and the child's trying to tell us something like, yeah, 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 but let's do it this way, you know. And really trying to hear what they have to say and see if we can help them to create something from what it is they're trying to say. And sometimes just saying like, I hear you, you know, like I hear what you're saying. And I'm sorry I didn't acknowledge that the first time you told me that. I was kind of caught up in my own thoughts. That's important stuff. We don't do that in culture enough, in my opinion. You know, we don't acknowledge our shortcomings or when we've not given a child their full dignity. And I think it's it's one of the most important things we do. Um, gain respect versus demand respect. <laughs> you do not talk to me that way. You know, like you can imagine if you you know you're in the environment and you're in there, you're having a great time, and if someone comes up and says something really unkind. And you know, you can't force them to respect you. We can't force our children to respect us. We can't force any human to respect another human. But what we can do is gain the respect. And sometimes we can just state what we see. Like you're really angry and you decide to say something um, to me that was out of your anger. And um, that's just all I have to say. And I could just walk away. I don't have to give them a lecture about how that hurt my feelings. I don't have to tell them about how I'm sad and I'm going to cry. Like, I don't have to give them all that. Now I'm trying to manipulate with you. I can just state what it was and affirm assertiveness and I walk away, you know? And so with that process of, and that's the way we can gain respect, because sometimes that child is, is testing us. We're teen. They're trying to see, do you really care about me? Like, what are you going to do if I do this? You act like you care, but what happens if I do this? You know, even if it's not 100 percent conscious, sometimes they are still testing us in some way. Normative culture versus social rules, and this is a hard one, and this is kind of what um, she was talking about with you know, if you don't know how things happen in an environment. Um, like I remember, we had a new staff member a few years ago, and I walked through, and she was working the extended learning program, and these children were up on top of the table dancing. Well, that was interesting. <laughs> you know, I kind of popped in. I said, is everything okay? And she's like, well, they told me they're allowed to do this. I'm like, yeah. yeah. So what do you think about that? Well, I didn't know. I didn't know. And so we talked about that whole process that, um, so there's social rules, like ground rules, respect yourself, others, the environment, right? And so if we can go back to that and try to, to, to think about what we've decided on as a group and so forth. And then there's normative culture, which means things that they start doing that we didn't realize they started doing. And now more people are doing it. And so really being aware that if you're not sure, you can always say, you know, I don't really know, and I'd rather us just wait for the teacher to get back from lunch, and then we can, we can decide. But we do it all the time. I'm so sorry I'm not aware. I just am not comfortable right now to do that. I'm, I'm sorry that's upsetting. Me. But we can talk to them as soon as they get back, you know? And so that way you're not creating or give it a catalyst for a new normative rule that starts and then the teacher comes back and says, why are they all blah, 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 you know? And it happens. And that age level, it happens very quickly, you know, as they go in that process. High ethical standards for all we do and say. And I've shared that with you a lot. We try to be humble. We show humility. Um, we don't say, well, it's OK. I can do it because I'm an adult. <laughs> you know, like, I don't bring my coffee in. I don't bring coffee, but Coke or my, you know, uh, soft drink or anything. And if kids don't have it. You know, um, I don't sit there in front of them and, and act like I'm different because I'm an adult. I don't sit on a table if they don't sit on a table. Um, I, if, if I know I fell short and I said, that wasn't nice what you just did to that child. It wasn't even that child. The other child over there, but I said, this child, I, I hold up to that, you know. I try to mean what I say and I'm, and I'm, I'm respectful. And when I fall short, I take responsibility for that. How do we help children to take responsibility? We have to take that responsibility first. And it's okay to question any of us at any time. You know, you could always say, I'm struggling. I saw this happen and I, I thought I understood that we're supposed to do this. They're like, well, I had a weak moment. You know, you might hear that from an adult or you might hear them say, well, this is why we do this differently at this age. And here's the why behind that. So those things are important. Um, you can kind of pull those on up if you want to. So if you're going to be a studio assistant, some of these things we've already talked about, prepare 
um, break down the room, um, come in with an open mind, especially if you're an age level that you haven't been in before. You know, just come in as a learner. We're all learners. Everyone in this building is a learner. And so it is okay for you to be a learner too. We don't put high pressure on you or judge you. If you're not sure what to do, we want to help you. You know, not just for us, but for you. Um, be aware of your own manner, like we talked about, uh, lotions or perfumes and that kind of thing. Um, shoes that might be really clumpy or hard to get up and down from, um, or to be outside in. Um, keep your children and teens safe. You know, it's a really important thing. If you ever see anything that you feel like is unsafe, please bring it to one of the staff members' attention immediately. It's our number one goal. And we don't see everything. And don't assume that we saw it, because we may not have, right? And so even something like, um, you know, a, a, a step that was wobbly, you know, like sometimes we don't know. And everyone else thinks someone else took care of it sometimes. So it's just important to follow up on those things. Um, so we talked about the supporting the physical, emotional, social, et cetera, always face them when we've seen activities, um, the adult commitments. Um, and ask for specific things you could do, you know, so like a lot of times this time of year in the 3 to 6 environment, there are lots of games um, on letter sounds. There's one called I Spy. And so that might be the thing you do in a studio. Is you come in for an hour, a couple times a week, and just play, play this game called I Spy, which just helps them to understand letter sounds. You may do choral reading. Who knows what choral reading is? So we use it a lot, especially with emergent readers. We do choral read with me, which means we're going to read at the same time. So let's read uh, this right here. You must feel angry about what? Do you notice how I'm pausing sometimes just to see, and not in a way like, <laughs> <laughs> but in just a way like I'm trying to see what she knows and doesn't know. And sometimes you can make a pact with a kiddo and say, <coughs> yeah, you know, let's let's make a deal. If we both come to a word, we don't know the word, we'll just say help, see if the other one can help us. You know, 